Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Sunder Katwala. I'm the director of British Future. Welcome to this webinar. Let's talk about race. Um, there's a lot of conversation going on about race at the moment. Let's try and uh, see where we can take it in this session and hear how we can turn this into a constructive moment for change. I've got a great panel with me to do that this lunchtime. We've got Saji Javi MP, um, who has been uh, the Chancellor, uh, the Home Secretary is the MP for Bromsgrove. Um, Saji, you took part in a British Future event about sort of 13 months ago, I think, um, which seems a lifetime ago now for the country and for you personally, but it'd be great to hear what, what you feel is changing in this moment. We've got um, Lord Simon Woolley, known to many of us, I think, as a grassroots campaigner on, on, on race over many decades, the founder of Operation Black Vote. He's now uh, elevated to being a crossbench member of the House of Lords and has been uh, uh, the, uh, the chair of the advisory group of the Race Disparity Audit. We have Andrea Owls, who is um, a partner at PwC, a colleague of mine as a trustee at British Future, uh, an expert on immigration and immigration law and an active member of ILPA, and also has a lot of expertise in how corporations uh, have been dealing with these issues of diversity and cultural change. And we have Lisa Egberdon, who is a, 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 an activist and a campaigner with the group Reclaim and has been involved with the uh, University of Manchester and Women's Budget Group on intersecting equality inequalities research um, and is involved uh, as an advisor in education as well. So lots of different um, experience uh, to bring to these debates. We're talking more about race than ever before. We had the killing of George Floyd in America um, which sparked a new round of Black Lives Matter protests uh, across the Atlantic. Um, that has come to Britain uh, and across the world where it's been about issues here, uh, race inequalities, about COVID, other issues about discrimination, opportunity, uh, identity in our society. So um, it's probably got more salience than ever before. What's going to happen now in terms of bringing about change? We want to hear perspectives of, is this year really a turning point or is this going to be an opportunity that we miss? Will we get sustained change? Are we now having the conversations we need about race or are some of the conversations we want still missing? This is a difficult issue for some people. How do we get beyond that? And race can be divisive and polarizing and there's an energy and an urgency to the campaigning. How do, we, how do we use that and find the common ground? They're the, they're the themes that I'm hoping we'll deal with across this hour. So I'd like to come to you um, first. As I say, it was a, a year ago we were, we were speaking of these issues uh, when you were the Home Secretary and heading into a party leadership contest. Um, really like to get your sense of um, what's going on now and how is this issue changing and how do we use this opportunity? Yeah, no, thank you very much. And uh, my thanks also to you, Sunder, and British Future for putting this to, together. Um, but you know, just in terms of uh, opening remarks, of course, uh, the, the, the killing of uh, George Floyd was you know, abhorrent in, in every way and perfectly, you know, rightly and understandably, it's provoked a huge amount of soul searching, uh, of course, in the US, uh, but across the world, uh, rightly, including um, here uh, in the UK uh, as well. And, you know, my, my initial thoughts uh, were really that, you know, on the one hand, you know, we are not the United States. And uh, you know, I lived in the United States for, for, you know, for many years uh, when, when I first started work. And I think I understand the country well. And I think when it comes to, to race and especially in their criminal justice system, they, you know, they've got some you know, really, really big entrenched problems and, 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 the, and the killing uh, that we all um, now know about uh, is is just one you know horrible example uh, of that. Um, on the other hand, though, um, you know we we also do still have challenges and uh, what, for policing, for example, uh, we all will remember uh, the 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 murder uh, of um, Stephen Lawrence and and the report that led to and the the fact that our our police uh, in in the UK was referred to as institutionally racist, which I thought was, even at the time, I wasn't involved in politics and I, I thought it was a very fair assessment. Big changes had to be made and we've seen a lot of changes, but we still uh, have uh, challenges. Uh, just after the George Floyd uh, killing, I mentioned to a few people, for example, 
uh, that, uh, you know, in our criminal justice system, actually thanks to some of the work that David Lammy did when he looked into to it, uh, that uh, we have a, a more disproportionate amount of uh, black uh, men in our prisons than we than the US actually have. And a lot of people were surprised uh, to hear that, but that is a, a fact. Uh, also, what it made me think about, I thought about my time as Home Secretary, uh, an event where it's, it's traditional uh, for the Home Secretary to attend uh, the last day of something called the, the Senior Leadership Course for UK Policing. And it's the sort of uh, the up and coming uh, police officers, the leaders of the future. They go to this training course at last month's and they visit London and they meet the Home Secretary. I went to speak to them. And uh, when I went, uh, I, I couldn't help noting and then remarking on actually in my, it, it, towards the end of my speech that uh, the policing in Britain, they have to do more uh, to become uh, more diverse uh, because in that room, when I was speaking to the future leaders of British policing, there were only two people that were not white. One of them was my brother and the other one was me. And, uh, and so the, you know, there's just examples of that, that show you there's just much more uh, that needs to be done. But, you know, when it comes to, to race and race relations, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think that yeah, there's, a, there's a lot we can celebrate as well as work on in, in terms of uh, improving. If I think about you know, my own life, uh, like um, many people uh, of color, I've faced racism my life. I still face racism every day. If you look at my social media feed, if you look at it after this seminar, this webinar, you'll see lots of people making racist comments uh, about me and, and uh, they shouldn't, but you sort of, uh, you get used to it in a way and we shouldn't have to. Um, but you know, at the same time, I remember that people told me you'll never get a good job, you'll never be an MP, you'll never be in the minister, you'll never be in the cabinet, and and uh, and the reason they said that is because they said, look, because your colour, your religion, it would just people won't accept you, and and they were wrong. That said, you know, we still have uh, much more to do, uh, and, and as an optimist, uh, I like to think that we rise to the challenge and that we can do much better. Thanks, Sarge. Lisa, I'd like to bring you in just to hear your uh, perspective on, on what you think uh, these campaigns and protests have been about and also how, how, you know, how they've been received, um, you think, by the, by the media, uh, uh, politics and others with power. And you're, you're muted, Lisa. There you go. I've now I'm muted myself. <laughs> Thank you. And first, I'd just like to say I appreciate everything that was just mentioned by um, Sajid. Um, personally, I'm going to speak as a young Black female growing up in the UK at this present time. Um, and my experiences from learning more about activism from 2010 up until the present day. Firstly, for me, Black Lives Matter has been perceived as a moment. And I wanna take the time to say, Black Lives Matter isn't a moment, it's a movement and it is my experience and the experiences of many other people of color and, black, and, and specifically black people um, in today's society. So when I hear people describe or perceive Black Lives Matter or our protest as a, as a moment, it kind of indicates to me that this is the reason why we're not able to be progressive in any of the changes that we make. Because a moment is something for me that happens right now and then when the next big thing comes around the corner, it completely just um, gets dismissed and fades away. Um, right now, it feels as though education is the focal point of being able to teach young people in particular about the racial issues and also the racial changes that have happened over the years. And it has been a lot of development in the UK for say, over a long period of time. But as a young person growing up from 2010 to 2020, I have not seen any progressive change. It feels like the UK in particular is very stagnant and we have now accepted that the situations that we're dealt with in terms of race is now a norm. And as a young person, this is very heartbreaking because we've not just institutionalized our institutional racism, but we've internalized that that's just the way that things have to be and, and it shouldn't be that way. Um, and lastly, it shouldn't have to take a tragedy, a death, 
to be high profiled in order for people to realize that there was a race issue, not just in the UK, but across, across the world. Um, because as we're probably speaking right now, there's someone out there that's facing some type of racial discrimination. There's probably people dying. I've seen Black Lives Matter protests. I've seen protests happen before it happened in 2016. And the same thing is still happening here and today, which just goes to show you that there is no change. There is no immediate immediate things that are being put in place to make sure that the killing of, of black people, the killing of um, people of color are prevented. Um, so race, race seems to be a very uncomfortable conversation to have. And I wanna change the narrative of that being an, of race being uncomfortable because I'm not uncomfortable in being in my skin, nor should I be made to feel uncomfortable in being a black woman growing up in the UK. So until, the, until Britain as a collective are ready to accept that there is an issue in regards to race, we will see no progression in the future. Thank, thank, thank you, Lisa, for that contribution, which sets us up very well. Andrew, you've had a lot of experience throughout your career, I'm sure, of people saying we must make progress, but probably experiencing how you know institutions probably do find race uh, rather uncomfortable sometimes. I'd love to get your perspective on, on whether there are new opportunities here and um, um, how you see it. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, um, so my name is Andrea Owls and I am a black female lawyer and my mum is from St Vincent and was asked to, to come here when there was a huge recruitment drive for nurses to join the NHS. Um, she was a teacher in St Vincent but wanted to come over here and do her bit for the mother country, um, the UK. My dad is from Barbados and was asked to come here. Um, when there was a recruitment drive for bus drivers and he arrived in 1962 and that may be why I'm an immigration lawyer. Um, they met in the UK and when my mum and dad arrived they were shocked at the racism that they experienced. My mum would come home and she'd say things like oh Mr X didn't want to treat me today as he wanted to wait for Mary who was a white nurse and this happened routinely and my dad would also experience awful racism on the buses. Um, growing up in London I myself have experienced many racist incidents but the first one that I remember, and that's the thing about um, being um, an ethnic, as it were, is that you always remember your first time. And the first one that I remember was when I was three years old. I was at nursery school and we were celebrating um, Princess Diana and, Princess, um, and Prince Charles' wedding. And the school decided to do a reenactment of the wedding and all of our names were put into a hat. And the children were asked to pick out an, um, a role out of the hat. And I picked Princess Diana and I was super happy because I'm dramatic but also I was just super happy and I went home told my mum and she started getting out the sewing kit and made me like a little bonnet and then we got some neck curtains because at that point neck curtains were you know really fashionable sorry to people who still have them um, and had them attached for the veil um, and a few days passed and then my mum was called into the school as the parents had complained that I was going to be Princess Diana and my mum stood her ground, as did my teacher, who was a true white ally, and said that the reenactment would still go ahead. I remember my mum being really upset on the day itself because two thirds, I'd say around that, or maybe even more of, of my nursery school boycotted the play. And it was just a three-year-old dressing up. And as you can hear, it's still like something that I find upsetting. Um, I was so upset um, because my, my, because it was at that time that my mum and dad had to have the talk with me about racism. And I just remember thinking, why don't they like me? Like I'm kind and I share my toys. So I didn't understand. Um, fast forward to last year, and I've now got seven nieces of varying ages, and I had to have the exact same conversation with them that my parents had with me because of racism. They experienced white children refusing to play with them because of the colour of their skin and their varying ages, you know, going from seven upwards. Um, moving, on, moving on again to earlier this month, I went to my dad's allotment. He is 81 years old now. And, um, and I was speaking to another allotment holder and this allotment holder knows me. He's known me since I was a child um, and he's white and also in his 80s. And I asked him just a simple question because I meet him all the time. I said, oh, how are you hoping, how are you coping with COVID? And he sudden, suddenly went into this outburst of why are you not causing trouble, pulling down statues, saying Black Lives Matter, slavery ended hundred hundreds of years ago, so what's the problem? 
and it was interesting to see like the different um, responses that we all had. My dad was silent because he's got to engage with this guy all of the, t- all of the time. I was reeling because I just didn't expect this. And the only way I can describe the physical feeling that it feels like when you experience racism to um, white people, it's like when someone scares you, you take like a sharp intake of breath, you feel all out of sorts. And then even when the danger is gone, the feeling stays with you for ages. And then you add on hurt to this feeling and an overall sense of powerlessness. And then you're cross with yourself that, you're, that, it even, that you even allowed it to impact you. So all of these emotions are happening simultaneously and then you end up not being able to speak and articulate why what has just happened is not okay. And this is one of the situations where white allies can speak up. And on that day, I had a white ally who challenged the allotment holders comments, but had also educated herself to be able to say that as UK taxpayers only finished paying off debt to UK slave owners in 2015, that it, it, it is a relevant point. I mean, there were lots of other points that she said, but equally this, this was a point that sort of like stunned him. Um, he didn't like the response and he walked off and went to sit in his car. Um, The reason I'm telling you these stories, which are painful, is that they span 60 years. Within that time, as Lisa said, um, and also as Sajid said, there have been various moments of of, um, history that have galvanised our attention. Joy Gardner, Rodney King, Stephen Lawrence, the Windrush scandal, and that's just to name a few, and that really is just to name a few. And what it shows is that whilst there has been progress, there is so much more that needs to be done to have true equality, to Lisa's point. The legislation needs to change and can assist, but more than that, we need more white allies, we need white people to be educated on these matters, and businesses are in a key position, I feel, to ensure that this happens. Um, Employee activism about racism, it seems relatively new. Um, PwC has signed an open letter making a a diversity pledge, along with Tesco, John Lewis, BT, ITV, Sky, M&S and many others. And the letter pledges to end the cycle of disengagement and states that inaction must end. The CBI have have firmly come out and said that firms should publish their ethnicity pay gap reporting and that this should be put into legislation. And PwC already do this and have done this for a number of years. Um, And a question that I've been asked a lot on these panels um, by white people is what can I do to help? And the only way that I can describe it is this, is that um, if you've ever suffered the loss of a loved one, you you will know that on the whole people come up to you at the funeral and they say is there anything if there's anything I can do to help just let me know and I'll do it but you as the grieving person you smile politely and you say of course I'll let you know thank you and then nothing happens but then there are the doers that are at the funeral and the doers who take action without you having to explain what needs to be done the people who wash the dishes before they leave or who bake a cake and bring it over or, or who in a very British way bring over the tea bags sugar and milk as they know that loads of people are going to be visiting the house and that is what we need from white people in the context of being anti-racist if you only ask what can I do to help my black colleagues or friends then nothing will happen because I think that by the very asking of the question question you might feel that look I've done enough I've shown some empathy and I've recognized the issue but this isn't enough what we need is we need real doers we need you to educate yourself try some things out they may not work black people aren't a homogenous mass you may feel like you're overstepping it may feel really awkward in fact it definitely will feel really awkward most times Um, but you need to keep trying and be an active ally. Andrea, thanks, thanks for sharing that. That was tremendously powerful um, uh, in, in setting up this, uh, this conversation we're, we're having today um, on your personal um, experiences. Simon, you, you've had so much um, experience of moments when things might change. Uh, when does change happen? Why change doesn't happen in the way that you might have hoped? What, what's your feeling about where we could go from here? Well, I do think it's an historic moment uh, it's not the moment that that Lisa doesn't want, that comes and goes and you forget it. But in the big historic context, uh, this is this is different. I would argue, I would argue that this nation would not be able to have the conversation, to listen to the stories, the painful stories that Andrea has just related 
pre-COVID, pre-George Floyd. And when you have a, uh, I think it was number two in terms of powerful politicians in our country, Sajid Javid, when he tells the world that on a daily basis, he receives racial abuse and he expects to receive racial abuse today. One is very brave of him to say so because part of the black experience is to downplay it or even deny it. The fact that my, my three panelists have felt empowered enough to lay bare, painfully lay bare these uncomfortable truths, I think is a, is a truly historic moment. And this moment has come about because of the um, perfect storm that we, we have witnessed over the last uh, four months or so. One part of the storm has been COVID-19. COVID-19 and the devastating impact that's had on, on, on a global level, but in particular for black and brown people. You know, when the pandemic began in this country on a daily basis, we would see black and brown faces on our screens. Uh, those working in hospitals, porters, nurses, doctors, cleaners, and then bus drivers, security guards, all those essential workers dying in disproportionate numbers was part of this perfect storm. And we knew, we knew that unlike when a, a minister said in the, the House of Lords, he said, Simon, this is a racist disease. And I said to him, minister, this is not a racist disease, but what this disease has done is that it's laid bare those areas of our society that are deeply racialized. What do I mean by that? I mean low pay, zero hour contracts, poor housing. All these elements have been accumulatory effects of why our communities have been hit hard, hit painfully. The other, the other aspect of this storm is the brutal murder of George Floyd. Uh, uh, watching a man die with his face in the ground, hands behind his back, and with his last words, calling out for his mother, telling the world, I can't breathe, it is about as painful as it gets. And I think that, that people of color watching that know one very, very uh, distinct factor. This wasn't just the knee that killed George Floyd. It was the American system. American system that says, you can treat African Americans and Latin Americans in certain ways that have extreme violence and get away with it, as many have. And whilst that was the extreme, his murder, his death, we know that the, that the, uh, a, a society, a system that engages in white supremacy and black inferiority is not just in the extreme where you kill people, but in housing, in health, uh, in employment, that system works against you. And while Sajid Javid said, yes, uh, the USA is particular in this area, he'll be, he, he admitted himself uh, that we're not a million miles away. Now, now here's the difference. This is what's been going on in, these, in, this, in this perfect storm. Uh, Sajid, I don't know whether you can concur with this. Uh, Sunder, you're close to our age. I can see some gray hairs there too. Uh, we know our sisters are young and, and, young and beautiful. We know that. Um, but it is probably the first time, the first time, Sajid, that I can remember when many more people, many more white people, I've seen the world through a black lens. And in that, they have said to themselves, something is profoundly wrong. Something must change. You know, when the couple, you know, the young couple that had a three month old child, the Nicola Williams, the athletes, when they were dragged out their car, handcuffed, left their three month baby 
in the car. Can you imagine, can you imagine Lisa, Andrea, uh, being dragged out of the car and having to leave your three month old child in a brutal attack by the police? Many white people said to themselves, that couldn't happen to us. And this is the moment in which we can have a conversation about our institutions, about our processes. Andrea, I am, I am not surprised, not surprised that big business is beating the path to your door and saying, if Black Lives Matters is to mean anything, how do we change? And I think, yes, they have to look, they have to look at themselves, they have to learn, but we have to help them too. And I know that's another burden, but, but in this moment, we've got to seize this opportunity because Sajid, I would say this, and you know, you've been in the heart of government. Out of this madness, out of this crisis, out of this heartbreak, if we are big enough and bold enough, we can create something special. I, I would end here, historians, We'll look back at 2020 and this perfect storm, this double pandemic, and ask, and ask but one question, Sunder. What was our response? We can do one of three things. We can do nothing. We can do a little, which is what our normal modus operandi does, tweaking around the edges. Or we can do something special. My hope, my sincere hope, that we have the, the, the passion, the heart, the bravery to do something very special. Thank you, uh, Simon. Um, uh, so we, we've had some very good perspectives to set us up. Just, um, um, I'll come back on, on some of this, just for participants watching this, put, put your questions in the Q&A or um, use the hashtag, um, let's talk about race to put your questions and we'll, we'll pick up on some of those. Simon, I just want to ask you um, one thing about, about you know, why moments get used or, or not used. You've been in and around the centres of power, you know, to an unusual extent for somebody who comes out of campaigning in this way. Theresa May had the race audit, there was talk about burning injustices. What's your sense of why things happen and why things get blocked from that experience? Great question. Uh, one simple answer, leadership. You know, Sajid knows uh, uh, above all of us because he's been at the center of power, uh, that when you are in a situation where you don't have to explain, you know, normally, normally Andrea, Lisa and I, when we're talking to people about race inequality, we're starting from minus 10, which means from minus 10, we have to get people to go to zero. That's normally our challenge. But when you're at zero, when Theresa May said to me, what shall we do? I said, we need to lay bare the uncomfortable truths. How do we do it? Set up a race disparity audit. Let's do it. Leadership. And here's the thing about leadership. Leadership is not just at the top with the CEOs, with the prime minister, with the ministers, all of us around this Zoom, all your participants that are watching this webinar, I hope today, Sunder, that they will own their own leadership. And when you own your own leadership, you know what happens? This is what happens. You get a blank sheet, you get a blank sheet, and you fill in what changes need to happen, and you make them happen. That's leadership. When we started Operation Black Vote 24 years ago last week, we had no money, no power, uh, no support anytime soon. But our leadership was, we have to change our world. We have to take responsibility. I hope, Sunder, in this time, I want leaders to emerge. Thanks, uh, uh, Simon. Lisa, we're hoping you'll emerge as a leader. Uh, in this and many more of your generation, of course. How far do you think that people taking part in these protests, people supporting them online, have the sense of what goes on the blank piece of paper? Do you think there is a sense of which changes matter most? Wh wh which changes would you most like to see? I'm gonna use this analogy in order to bring clarity um, to that sort of question. Protesting, conversation, is almost like the start of the race. You know, when you get the on, the, on your marks, 
what we need is people saying, let's go. What we need is people doing the running and making sure that they get to the end of that finish line. That is the part that we're missing right now in the UK. We're missing those people that say, let's go. We're missing those people that, that feel confident enough to have the legs to run and are being supported by the crowd, by the people around them to ensure that they, they do end up getting to the end of the race. There is this sense, especially amongst young people. I mean, the outcome of young people that were at the protest was absolutely immense. I particularly didn't go because one, I had to think about COVID. And two, because I've been there before, I've seen these protests happen. And like I said, it is just the start of the race. We need people on the inside, people within the system, our political leaders, our business leaders, everyone that has such a, a massive sort of um, influence in our communities, helping us progress within this race. Like I said, the, the outcome of people that came onto the protest was massive. And we can see that there's just a massive sense of all of us trying to do as much as we can right now in this present moment to make sure that this isn't just a moment that gets, fade, that gets faded away. And we have a moment like what Simon was saying, that is, that is something that we seize and we take charge of at this moment in time. However, it's scrambled because as we see, it's so frustrating whenever we take a step forward, whenever we do these protests, whenever we have these conversations, there is a massive backlash. And the backlash seems to be far more greater than the initial um, sort of stepping stone that we're trying to make. And us as black people, us as a, um, a colored community, we don't know how to handle the backlash because we don't think that we should be in a position where any sort of rebuttal or any sort of tiff should be happening in this present time. Racism in the UK isn't, isn't physical, as physical as we see in the States, but racism in the UK is very internal and it's very psychological. There are invisible chains that exist within our minds as people of color. There are invisible chains that exist within our schools and there are invisible chains that exist within our institutions, whether that be businesses, employment, work, politics. And if we, don't, if we don't find a way to deal and bring these invisible chains to light, we will settle. And like I said at the very start, we will not progress and we will not move forward. We need to start having those conversations and I appreciate um, Simon, you mentioning this very heavily. This is a time for all of us to unite and to come together and fight something that has been existing and has just found a way to sort of mold itself and reconstruct itself in a different way. The UK, for me as a young person of colour, I feel is very poisoning. It's poisoning and it's suffocating because I am only the only, like the youngest out of everyone here. And I take on the activist approach, being able to publicly speak and having the opportunity to publicly speak, but there's so many young people out there that have the, that have the passion and have the drive that I do, but they're not given the opportunity to do so. Therefore, we have to come back onto education. And I hope that we touch on education a lot more further. I don't want to, you know, ramble on and <laughs> sort of keep everyone on their toes kind of thing. But education is so important. And if we're able to teach our young people about being comfortable and accepting of races, of different cultures, of different ethnicities, whatever it may be, then we'll be able to have more people that are ready to sort of run the race with us rather than sitting on the back seat and, you know, just being there for the sake of face, like I feel like the media has done. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Lisa. Sarji, to come back to, to, come back to you uh, about this challenge of taking these issues into the corridors of power. I'm interested to know whether you find yourself speaking differently about these issues than you were able to maybe 10 years ago as a new MP. Is that space opening up or is the backlash higher? And this issue, Simon says, you know, we can have a blank sheet of paper. 
Britain isn't America. Do we know what the priorities here are in Britain? What, what changes should we be pushing for? There's a new race commission uh, being set up. A lot of people might be hopeful of that. Other people are very skeptical. It will do anything. How do we, how do we deal with this frustration about whether things change and, and find the changes that we need? Well, um, first of all, I think everything I've heard uh, you know, so far, the way from Andrea, from Lisa, from Simon, all three have been you know, incredibly you know, powerful and, and, and thoughtful, and there's, and there's a lot there. Um, but to go straight to your uh, question, first, I think in our politics, uh, that uh, things have changed uh, for the better in terms of um, the politicians, whether that's at the Westminster level, even at local level and things. Uh, being more um, willing to uh, and openly discussing uh, issues of race and the, and the challenges uh, that are there. If I think back from, you said in the last 10 years, you know, before I was elected uh, in, in 2010, there were only uh, two conservative non-white members of parliament. Um, the, uh, you know, fast forward now 10 years, not just in the conservative party, but in Labour and all parties, um, there, there are people of um, you know, whether brown or black, or people of different uh, ethnic uh, backgrounds, and and that in itself has, as I think, is leading uh, to change. It's a great thing to see. I think we need to do more, uh, but it's it's helping the debate. Um, and then just to turn to some of the things that, that, that have been said, then I understood exactly what Lisa meant when she said that she doesn't just want this to be a moment. And of course, she's absolutely right. And I do think. You know, so far, this is like I think Simon was uh, saying, this is a movement, and I think it can also be um, you know, something special, but, but it needs to continue. We, this, there's good momentum uh, right now, but we can't uh, assume that that's going to uh, just continue. One thing I, I have learned through politics that other events come along, you know, completely unexpected, completely unrelated, and they will dominate the agenda. We know that you know, Brexit has dominated Parliament for, for, for many years, coming towards an end now, but it's been there. Obviously, COVID came along, and uh, uh, but it's interesting that even with sort of COVID and the news globally around COVID, the one thing that really, really cut through and made a difference uh, you know, beyond COVID was um, the, uh, the, the protests around the world um, after the killing of George Floyd, and it, and it still does, but we just can't assume that. And that is why I think you need structures to make sure that the, the change uh, happens and that people keep working on change. And that's why I think something like the commission the Prime Minister set up that you referred to, Sunder, it is important because it, its work will continue, whether this is in the news one day or not, the work continues, you put the right people in the commission, and then it's up to the government to react to that. And then also just to Simon's point on leadership, and I couldn't uh, agree with him more, and uh, he's a really good uh, example with uh, Theresa May, and of course I was there, I was the, when she started the Race Disparity Audit, I was the community secretary, I was very involved. And, uh, you know, I played a part, but it happened because the prime minister wanted it to happen. And when the prime minister says that I want every department to look at this, I want them to look at the outcome from public services based on people's race, it never been done before, not just in Britain, never been done anywhere in the world, but that kind of data is then invaluable to then getting change. And, and we've already seen a lot of that data published and, and a lot of it sadly shouldn't surprise us about higher unemployment rates for ethnic minority people, lower salaries, uh, fewer opportunities and things. And, uh, and dip, you know, some, of, some of that will be uh, down to race issues. Some of it might be completely unrelated to the health type issues and things, but the point is we need the data uh, and keep working on that. And it's great that that department, the RDA, that work has continued and this commission can now build on it. And the last thing I'd say in terms of change, we shouldn't also be waiting for the commission to do its job and, and then sort of thinking, right, nothing to do now, let's wait for the commission and, and, and then we can um, you know, follow up on what it says uh, because we can't afford to wait. And, uh, and, and, the, and the signs are that that's not what the government's planning to do. So just this week, for example, we, when um, Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, responded to Wendy Williams' excellent report into lessons learned from the Windrush uh, scandal, um, you know, the Home Secretary set out your know, five concrete things that the Home Office is going to do in terms of training and recruitment and then getting Wendy to come back to look at all that. You know, they're getting on. Uh, with that. And that's important is too, we, we shouldn't be just waiting for commissions and things to report, we need to be getting on with it. 
So, so to your answer to the question then, we, you know, a lot of people say we don't need another inquiry, we've had a lot. Is, is your main point, well, because the Prime Minister is behind it, it can make a difference, or, or does it need to do something that other inquiries haven't done? Um, I, I think, that, you know, first of all, because the, the Prime Minister is behind it, and it clearly is, that, that, you know, that, that matters a lot, because in, in our politics, you know, change you know, only really happens or happens properly if the Prime Minister of the day really wants it to happen, because there'll be so many other sort of competing things on his or her mind. So that's, that's uh, important as well. Um, it, 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 in, in terms of um, the, you know, how profound this commission can be, the changes it comes up with, um, we, I mean, I, I'd love to think it's going to uh, you do lots of different, really big, important things. Um, that, but I'm not. I'm going to wait and see, and uh, and 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 let and, and judge it by um, the, uh, not judge it too early on. Um, it's got it's got some very serious people on there that can really contribute. I know already from a you know, number of people from across government already have called me and asking me about how. I can help my own thing, uh, ideas, and I know they're calling around and asking a lot of people, and that's great to see. Um, but there are so many areas uh, that we need to work on, both within government, but also, uh, as has been said, and you know, Andrea and Lisa and others have talked about it, with business uh, as well. You know, business is going to be absolutely key to this, and uh, and some businesses I just think are more sincere in this than others. For others, I, I just think sometimes a bit of a tick box exercise. Uh, but we are seeing some business that are really sort of for the first time, probably really seriously taking this and asking and reaching out and seeing and asking what they can do. Thanks. Thanks, Sergeant. Andrea, that, that's an interesting point. I think that um, business faces this same challenge as government, really, that people are quite um, frustrated or sceptical or fatigued by the statements because they've heard it. You know, we've been talking about this for 20 years at least. Um, how far, when I see some of these statements of companies saying, of course, it doesn't need saying that Black Lives Matter, but Black Lives Matter, here's the hashtag, here's the statement, but we need to listen and empathise and talk more. How far do you think companies know what they need to do? And how far do they need to think harder about what that change looks like? I think that there's a real mixed bag. So um, if I take PwC as an example, um, we're in our fourth year of um, publishing our ethnicity pay gap um, uh, reports. Um, since uh, the 25th of May, when um, the murder took place, we've had um, a number of panels which I've been, which I've sat on, that where we've had um, a safe space, a safe space for um, black colleagues to talk about how they're feeling. They've, they've also been, um, run some well-being sessions where it's um, much smaller sessions with um, black and brown people talking to each other about the experiences that they've experienced along with um, like a mental health advocate. They've signposted um, counseling for um, uh, colleagues as well. Um, uh, you know, across the board, um, and our chairman held a um, uh, a webinar where over um, eight out excuse me eight thousand people attended. So I personally would like to see this as an authentic turning point where people are no longer sort of racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic. Um, however. And, and, and you'd, I'd also hope that it would be this moment of when you know better, you do better. And I am relatively positive that for most people it is, but I'm, I'm realistic enough to know that people will only do that if it impacts them. And I think the accountability part is, that, is what we need to look at to your point around what is the action. So if you want to encourage um, business performance, you undertake appraisals. It's a key part of the employer and employee relationship. There are clear objectives that are set out at the very beginning of the year, and then you're measured on them. Um, and the same for business businesses as a whole, they set out a strategy and they look at where they are and they're benchmarked marked against that strategy and I think the one thing that's missing for companies this and this is as a whole um, is clear set key performance indicators KPIs that are, back, that are baked into the strategy and um, personal objectives and the business and its employees to make sure that they're measured against this in the same way how you would measure revenues or how many clients you've won it means that those who already do this kind of work they will be recognized quite rightly and those who don't will follow the pack as it will um, um, impact their end of year appraisal. Um, I also think another thing that um, that in order to not just pay lip service to it is um, about obtaining data on your people. But whilst obtaining data is key, 
um, and it should definitely be done. It can also serve as a blocker to action that can be taken now. Therefore, I think it's action and a collection of data that needs to be done simultaneously to make sure that uh, momentum isn't lost. And another action that I think that companies could take is having a mechanism for reporting racist incidents. And this is to Simon's point, which is that many companies, they've got excellent whistleblowing initiatives like they're brilliant they're right up there you know speak up speak now my door is always open type of culture um but racism in the workplace is still underreported and the reason for that is because it's off-putting having to explain to someone who is senior who is usually white the experience that you've gone through and to Lisa's point with um uh UK racism sometimes it is very blatant and it's very violent and it's very out there and it's very overt but sometimes the racism and unconscious bias that you that you that you're on the end of um as a black person in the UK can make almost make you feel like you're going crazy because it's that subtle and so what you don't want to end up doing is having to not or censor yourself and not say anything because you're having the person who you're, you need to explain to doesn't understand and isn't starting from that footing um, and the last thing I'd say around um, what I think the corporates could do to Sajid's point around making sure that it's not that people aren't doing it on face value is the term BAME so I know that historically the term BAME has been an amazing word to kind of get us to where we need to go and really like you know galvanize and pull us all together so then we're you know all facing ahead and looking and, and, and all going in the same direction but the reason why I take issue with the acronym at the moment is when it's being used to cover um, or to hide um, significant disparities because and an example is uh, there are 800 senior partners in the top legal firms and only six of them are black so you can see when you move the B away from the aim that there's even more of a problem and that's not to say that there isn't already a problem with the aim it's just that the aim is doing better than the B in the BAME um, and then um, and so there's clearly there's clearly an issue and even within the big four it's been recognized there are 3,000 partners and only 11 of them are black so there's clearly an issue here with within all corporates um, and an example of that is when we see the graduate intake so a lot of big companies they're taking graduates and everyone starts off on the same footing however at some point normally just before manager level um, the black graduates and the brown black brown gra graduates become stuck at the level just below managers and it's companies looking at this and and I know for a fact that PwC are already doing a lot of work in this area and making sure that um, they can um, you know push things forward and turbocharge some of the initiatives that they already had coming but that needs to be done across the board and maybe that's where legislation comes into it. I'd like to ask Lisa just then about the point you've just raised there Andrew about labels like like BAME Black, black Lives Matter has been about the specific black experience and people uh, who are white, people who are black have campaigned on that. How much do these sorts of labels matter and how do you balance that issue of the specific black experience and the broad coalitions you want on racism and opportunity and class and other issues? Andrea, literally, like when, when she said it, I was like nodding away and my neck almost sort of fell off. BAME is now used as an umbrella terminology to mask particular issues um, that certain individuals face. This checkbox of BAME has been used to sort of make racial issues that might, might exist where, wherever it may be easier to sort of manage. However, as a black woman, my experiences are completely different to an Asian woman. And I would love to live in a world where my experiences as a black woman are equally appreciated and acknowledged rather than it always sort of being undermined or covered by the terminology BAME. When, honestly, I think I was introduced to BAME about two years ago. I had no idea what it meant. I was just like, BAME? <laughs> I was like, there's black people, there's Asian people, there's minorities and that, that that's, it is what it is, you know? Um, so, for me, this checkbox has allowed our system to overshadow and not acknowledge the issues that, that, are, that we're presented with. Um, and like I said, I'd love to live in a world where people just acknowledge me for just being a, a black woman. Um, 
a black young woman in the UK, for me, feels like a triple threat. You know, I've got three things working against me, which means I have to work three times harder, which means I have to fight three times harder um, to make sure that my voice is heard and to make sure that I'm acknowledged within school um, and within the workplace. Just really briefly, um, I'm a law, I'm studying law, so I'm a law student. And I remember having conversations with people like, oh yeah, like I'm gonna go and study law and everyone's sort of instant reaction. Even my family members were like, it's gonna be hard for you because you're, you know, you're a black woman and you're trying to make it in law. Like how many black lawyers do you know? And then it's kind of like when you hear in society and talk about, oh yeah, like I'm going, I'm going into law. It's like, oh yeah, there's lots of people of color, you know, studying law. By that, they mean there were a lot of Asian people that are studying law. And it was like, well, what about the black people in particular? Um, so that's why I say I kind of like come down onto this thing of identity um, and this me this meshed identity that things terminologies like fame has now created and um, that really need to be challenged. And I think the best place to challenge this is within schools. Um, I'm currently a youth advisor for a supplementary school that will be coming into Manchester called Rekindle. And one of our biggest aims is to make sure that we provide young people with a cultural education and this will allow people of colour, whether you're Black, whether you're Asian, whether you're, I don't know, any sort of race, to feel comfortable and explore your culture without it being seen as tokenistic or being umbrellaed um, within the term BAME. So yeah, that's kind of my my position in that. Great. Simon, I'd love to get your view. I mean, this debate has swung different ways over the decades, and clearly we want the very specific data, but we want the overarching picture as well. But also, you've worked very hard to build solidarity, to build commonality. Is there, is there a balance to be struck here? Well, as you know from Operation Black, but we're old school. Uh, black was political black, that non-white was black. But we also, we also further articulated African, Asian, Caribbeans within, you know, Africa is a continent, by the way with a kaleidoscope of cultures, languages, religions. Uh, but uh, to speak to, to Lisa's to view, that unless we are bold enough to, to have the caveats, to have the further articulation, I, Lisa, I'm particularly worried about when people talk about um, the, the DNI in business, Andrea, the DNI sector. And obviously, and to my experience, what the DNI uh, agenda really means is is really enabling white women uh, to gain their place on the board, but uh, people of color wait your turn, and so we we do have to be we do have to be specific, uh, we do have to further articulate. But one thing I would warn uh, Lisa and Andrea is this: that there are many people who would like to herd us in a cul-de-sac to just be talking about BAME, whether it's useful, whether it's not. And in the meantime, Rome's burning. You know, this is a, this is a moment where, where we can have, as, as all the panelists have said, the most profound conversations about structural inequality, racial inequality that we've ever had. We mustn't get, we mustn't get sidetracked uh, blight with, with blinkers in a cul-de-sac to discussing one thing, we must focus on the priority. Your conversation is relevant, but let's prioritize and ensure that we, as you said, Lisa, uh, seize the moment. Thanks, Simon. Now, just looking at the questions that have been coming in, a lot of questions sparked by um, some of the things Andrea was saying about advice to white allies, which people have found very helpful, have liked that appeal, have wanted to know more about. So I'm just going to share a few perspectives and questions that have come up. Dr. Val Ogden says, really interested in that appeal, trying for 50 years, but continuing to try to be educated about what, 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 what the contribution should be. And her question is, how, how, how to handle the issue of white people not getting that power of whiteness, which she finds to recur and recur, and would like advice about that. But a couple of other perspectives on the same question, but, but coming from a slightly different perspective, um, perhaps. Ivan Humble said um, he gets that challenge of having to step out of a comfort zone as well to speak out. But then there will be black people saying black lives matter isn't the agenda that works 
for them and that will that will be used then by other opponents how to navigate the different views that there are among people and then my colleague Jill Rutter has a has a, a another question about white responses to this uh, and white allies and she says that from the research she's been doing during COVID she thinks there is broad support for the objectives of the protesters particularly around the killing of George Floyd and the understanding of racism but that the term white privilege makes people very, very defensive. And so her question is, is there a different way? Is that a good way? Or is there a different way to get across the thought that people are disadvantaged by the color of their skin? So I suppose the question there is, is white privilege a necessary discomfort or is, is it not the most useful way to make that point? Andrew, did you want to respond sure. to any of those thoughts? Um, so I, so um, I think that this is sort of a message to white people as it were. Um, it's going to be uncomfortable at times and you're not always going to get it right. Black people and brown people are not just one homogenous mass where you're able to have a conversation that go exactly the same way or the way that you wanted it to go. Um, and my, my um, I, I always talk about making sure that you speak out, um, whether you're in a party, um, in the park, um, or you're, you know, just have, or at play like with your friends. The bit that where the, the white allyship comes in is where the, where a joke is made, where you know that something's been said and it's not quite right. And what you and, and what you do is that you don't say anything because the Britishness in us doesn't doesn't want to make the situation uncomfortable. And it's that side of things that I would like white people to really become involved in and speak out and, and have the uncomfortable silences and kind of truly get involved in, um, in, in activism and the way in which that they can do that on an individual level is around that anytime they're hearing something or something's not quite right, they raise it, they say it, they say it at the time because by you being silent, it means that you've acquiesced with whatever the person was saying and that person can then continue. From a, um, uh, from a, a work perspective, I think that white people should be within their firms challenging them and asking them what are they doing about Black Lives Matter? What are they doing about amplifying black voices within the organization? What are they doing about BAME? What are their statistics? What are, the, what, are there any mentoring programs? Um, and and on an, going back to the individual level, but in work, when you're asked to be part of a panel or part of a project, and you can see that the people around you, like it's an all white male panel, for example, ask the question, is it that I, is, is there somebody else who I could bring in who could replace me? Or is there somebody who I could suggest? Um, or even just to raise it, you don't even have to go as far as that, because every, I'm sure that everybody wants the opportunities to speak out. But what you could do is just raise it with the organisers and say, oh, I think it would be really good to have a person of color on the on you know on on the panel or as part of this project for that diversity of thought um and the last thing that i say about it is um i think that you've got to challenge yourself to feel uncomfortable and know that there are going to be situations where you are going to get this wrong where you where you where you um, where you do need to tread carefully and that's why I use the example of the grieving situation sometimes you don't know what to say to somebody who's had somebody uh, you know just die so it's about you trying and continuing to try and to the person who said they've been trying for 50 years good on you carry on like that's what we need and at least I'd like to bring you in on this. I mean, you campaign with Reclaim for the voices of working class people to be better heard um, publicly. So, um, you know, a lot of white people say, you know, I don't feel very privileged in my life. Is that is that a problem for the way that the idea of white privilege is, is heard or received? Um, I'm happy that you mentioned that because I think Firstly, I just want to say, again, like almost like a message to white people, a message to all, it's okay to speak up and it's okay to speak out. Um, and there's the, over the years, I've started understanding that there seems to be this sort of misunderstanding with the um, terminology of white privilege. And it's almost sort of confused with your class. So people would put um, sort of white privilege and be like, white privilege is only for the middle, cl um, the middle class or like the ruling class. Whereas white privilege, for me in this day and age, and I think for a lot of black people and people of color, is just you have the opportunity 
to freely speak out, knowing that you're not going to face any form of repercussion or any sort of prejudice or have sort of people evil eye you because you're speaking up on a matter that may not necessarily concern you. White privilege goes beyond that. White privilege needs to be something that's appreciated if it's used in the right way. It's not something to be ashamed of. And I think when I've spoken to white peers before, as soon as you're like, yeah, use your white privilege, they, they kind of get all uncomfortable and they're like, oh no, I'm not, I'm not privileged. And for me, if you're going to be an ally, of a movement of people of color, then really acknowledge and really appreciate the privilege that you have if you use it correctly. Of course, you can completely abuse your, your white privilege, um, which is not what we want and not the kind of people that we want advocating for us. Um, but yeah, like this just misunderstanding needs to be worked on. And I think the, the definition of white privilege has definitely changed over the years, especially within my generation. If it's used correctly, those are the type of people that we need as allies and we need help in us sort of fight our fight. Our fight. Um, yeah. Sajid, what's your experience of how the language we use matters or doesn't matter around this issue of the coalitions and the changes that we want? You know, I think it does matter. And, and as an example, that soon after the, the killing of George Floyd, I, I wrote an article in the newspaper and, I, and one of the things I talked about in that uh, was um, how I think some sections of society, I was talking about affluent people, um, which are predominantly white people in this country, that, um, that uh, some, some of them, they don't, because of the lives they live, you know, you know couple of houses, go to the country, nice holidays in private schools and all that kind of thing. Um, they, they don't see or they, they just don't see the kind of racism other people would do, uh, including other white people. And, and, and as a result, uh, perhaps they just walk away think that it doesn't really exist. And this is a, a, a problem that people are just exaggerating and things. And of course not. But I think that that does happen. And there's no easy way to change that. But I think at least a, a couple of times as I talk about the importance of schools and education and things for the, especially for that younger generation, I think that is an important part of it. But hopefully now with uh, with uh, the, the aftermath of the, the killing of George Floyd and the movement that's led to more people can understand that this is this is actually very real. And uh, and just because it might not affect you, um, that it doesn't mean to say that it's something that um, you can do a huge deal. Uh, to to help change. I also, in terms of the definitions and things, I, this is the the title of your webinar. Uh, let's talk about race, right? And and we want to, you know, uh, and and as you said at the start, uh, Sunday, there are some things about race that uh, you know people haven't talked about. They feel uncomfortable and things. And it was interesting. It just made me think that when we were talking about BAME, and I, by the way, I agree. Uh, the, I absolutely understand what Andrea said. There absolutely are significant disparities within. Uh, BAME and we need to understand what those are so in the race disparity audit it makes a big point about whether it's talking about Afro-Caribbean or Bangladeshi background or Pakistani background and so forth and I think that's important but there's also racism within BAME right and we've we've got to talk about that as well you know there there is a uh, we know that there are a Asians that don't like black people and vice versa we know within the Asian community between different groups there's racism, often sometimes based on religion or other differences, and this exists. And uh, and, and it's important. Sometimes I think um, the uh, people that uh, that, um, that are doing the right fight, the fight against racism, tend to sort of deny that this actually happens, or want to want to sort of uh, sort of make it much much less of an issue. But it is it is also an issue, and uh, and that is important because the kind of things we're trying to address. You know, Andrea was talking about in PwC the work that they're doing. Now, I don't know enough about PwC, but I bet you there's a lot more Asians uh, that are in senior positions than there are black people in senior positions, right? And that's true within government as well, within civil service. It was certainly true within banking uh, when I worked in that industry. And, um, and, and, and to what extent could that also be explained by this unconscious bias or other uh, types of uh, uh, um, your racial 
profiling behavior. And I think that's important to address as well. We mustn't ignore it. And Simon, another question on, on a similar theme, really. Um, Raghi Bali has made the point that we're talking about white privilege at a time now when the white British have worse educational outcomes compared to blacks and Asians. So how do you avoid getting the agenda derailed by, by disadvantage for, you know, uh, poor white children, poor black children? What, what do you do about that? Well, it's about having a nuanced conversation, I think, as, as Sajid has just mentioned. Um, that there are different uh, outcomes for different racial groups. Uh, the, the worst outcomes for one group in particular on every level uh, are the traveler community, the Gypsy, Roma and traveler community. I mean, it's pretty horrendous. Uh, they get abused. The lack of opportunities is pretty shocking. But in terms of the white privilege, of course, if you are, if you are working class and feel downbeaten, it doesn't feel like you've got privilege. I think that the articulation of white privilege is that certain things uh, uh, would probably not happen to you as they happen to black people. And I think stop and search is a classic example, that the one that I gave, that a, that a middle-class white couple with a three-month-old child would not be brutally harassed as a black couple might be. And so, you know, in this moment, in this moment of, of this, of this um, uh, perfect storm, that we've got to be able to have these, these honest conversations that need to be nuanced, that, uh, that as and Andrea has articulated, we've got to take people along. And we've always said this, look, this isn't a zero sum game. When you take away the barriers, when you begin to unleash talent, it must be said that everybody benefits. That first and foremost, we become comfortable with ourselves because we better understand, we better understand how uh, one person's life uh, is being uh, seen and the, the microaggression that happens. The microaggression, when I go on the tube, doesn't matter if I'm in a nice, my very best suit, my very best Sunday, Sunday church shirt, that I can be standing, uh, in behind a white woman and she'll look at me and then hold her handbag. I mean, the aggression that puts on me, uh, I cannot even begin to tell you. Or that when my 14 year old son walks into a shop and he's followed around as though he's public enemy number one. And so it's these microaggressions that need to be laid bare, need to be understood. And, and people believe us when Andrea says, it's shockingly painful and nobody should endure that. Uh, this, is that this is that moment. I know I, I did see somewhere um, on, on the social media, they said, oh, you've got all black and brown faces on this panel. You know, where's the diversity there? Look, let me say, this is our time to speak about our realities. Uh, and, and actually that we've got 83, 84 people on this and on the social media, hundreds of maybe thousands. This is, a, this, is a con this is a conversation that we want to do in our space for you, that you can learn from too, and we can be better together. This is what this is all about in this very, very critical moment. So don't say, oh, where's the white person? Where's this? This is our voice. These are our stories. And if we under better understand them, and then we can recalibrate whether it's in law, whether it's in the business sector, whether it's with black youths demanding change on the street, I promise you it's a win-win. So all for those participants, black and white, that as a, I'm a disciple of Dr. Martin Luther King, and I think that we all of you have a leadership role to change our world. Thanks, Simon. I'm just going to give you all one last chance to just give me a priority for change. Just lots of questions we didn't get to work. You know, the big theme was, you know, words are, words are fine, but will the action come? Will we see legislative change? What will happen actually for black teachers in school? Um, Joe Skeeping is setting up a, a course on uh, critical thinking about race, migration, history. Would love to have ideas about that. So lots of things that people want to see change. I'd just like to hear from each of you just as, as we close here. Uh, what's, what's the area that you'd particularly like to see focused on this year as the change as the change that could 
happen? Maybe I'll start with you, Andrea. Um, I think that um, I would like people to just continue. So um, I was on a call um, the other day with some black colleagues and um, one of my black colleagues said, um, I'm tired of beating the drum all the time about racism. And, um, you know, I'm a junior person and I'm being asked by very senior people to, to run sessions. And my sister, who is an assistant head teacher, she's been um, tasked to um, essentially create some black lesson plans um, as though the teachers who are currently there can't, can't also research themselves. Um, so that's, that's quite a difficult thing. So I think that what, what I'd like to say about it is that um, if you're tired of beating the drum about racism, there's a, there's a group of us now, there's this kind of collective mass. And when you feel tired, you hand the drumsticks over to another person and we'll carry on the drum beat. The drum beat. So what I'm trying to say is that you should find the person within your organization, or if there are not enough of you, find people outside of your organization. On the days that you feel tired, exhausted, and feel that you've had enough, you hand over the drumsticks and you watch the beat play out until you're ready to start again. And if you're not ready to start again, because this is exhausting and upsetting, um, just sit back and you can just enjoy the beat but just know that you're part of this movement as Lisa said rather than it just being a moment um, and you know I've experienced a lot of racism throughout my life um, but what's interesting to me is that I'm always shocked by it which I suppose means that I've got an inherent deep-seated hope that things will become better and so fingers crossed they will. Thanks. Simon, what what would what was the top of what's the biggest change, for example, this race commission could could make uh, by Christmas? Well, I, I'm not just crossing my fingers. I'm putting my shoulder to the wheel to tackle the persistent race inequality. Uh, you know, you know, Sunder, you said to Andrea that um, she's a leader in the making. She isn't a leader in the making. She's a leader now, right now. And if I was PwC, she'd be promoted to a partner anytime soon. And she's with a partner, she's a partner. That, that last she's year. a partner. Well, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. double your salary, partner. Yeah. And never forget, Lisa. Uh, when, uh, as an activist, there's nothing I like more than succession planning. And when I see you, when I hear you, I, I feel hopeful that our generation can take the reins and run and run and run and run. Look for it's our time to be special. Uh, we have our brother Sajid, who's been at the heart of government. Knows where the bodies are buried, by the way. Won't tell anyone just yet. We'll have to buy him a drink. He knows where the bodies are, so the bodies are buried. But what he can, can, what he can impart to our communities is how power works. Where are the levers? How do we move the dial? Because, you know, often we are politically illiterate to understand how, Lisa, you take your energy from the street and get it into legislation and get it into business to move the dial. My, my thing, Sonda, is a bit like Andrea, to be hopeful, but to act. And we need a COVID-19 race equality strategy. But the one thing I would say, Andrea and Lisa, particularly for your generation, is to believe. To, to believe, to believe that you will change our world. And in changing our world, everybody benefits. So, Saji, tell us, tell us uh, how the leaves of power work and how Lisa particularly can grab hold of them uh, and make them work. Well, we haven't got enough time for me to tell you where all the bodies are buried. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, but uh, I'll have a drink with Simon and I can share a bit of that with him. But, but it is an important point that Simon's really made. And that, you know, there's, the, there's so many things that you know, we've even just talked about now in the last hour or so that we know that could be done that would help. And then it's how do you turn those ideas into into practice? There's seen good examples of sometimes when that's happened, but also some example when you'd think an idea is so obvious and it should happen and it still hasn't, whether that's in government or even with uh, with with some businesses. But one thing that does make difference, uh, I think that, um, and this will be my, you asked for like one sort of thing that you can like could be a really, if it was, if you were going to focus on one big thing, what that might be, that I think makes a difference uh, uh, is having more diversity at all levels in all organizations. So all levels, meaning 
uh, not just you know people on the, uh, the, the sort of uh, the lower skilled semi skilled jobs but uh, working up right through the organization including of course the leadership uh, levels we need much more diversity and in all organizations i say that deliberately because it's the public sector as much as the the private sector and public being everything from sort of elected people to unelected uh, advisors civil servants and um and there just isn't enough of it. So if I think about my own experience in the last few years, I've mentioned earlier about Parliament becoming more diverse, but we need more. Um, if I think about the Home Office, about policing, about Treasury civil servants and things, the BBC and things, you know, these kind of public organisations, but then also business, because I think the more people that you have that have come from different backgrounds, different experiences, whether they are, are black or brown or whatever their experiences are, they that will inevitably help to change that organization and the culture of that organization. So I'm a, a big believer in the importance of uh, diversity and that can be done in many ways, whether it's recruitment, it's promotion, it's uh, through unconscious bias training, you know, all these things and, and many others are important to increase diversity. Thanks, Lisa, your final word to you as to what, what you think can change here. There's a long list, but I'll keep it nice and short and sweet because the majority of it's already been covered. Um, Firstly, it's just a message to everyone where by in the public eye, we have to tiptoe around the truth and we should not be tiptoeing any longer. Be prepared if you do want to make change to start having uncomfortable conversations and holding people accountable where accountability needs to be held. Intersectionality is a massive thing. Um, this goes beyond race now. This is gender, this is age, this is class. Um, we really need to acknowledge the differences that we have within society there needs to be more support and for it not to be a taboo more support for BAME led groups um, and in particular supporting projects like Rekindle supporting projects like um, Reclaim that are teaching the youth and making making it their mission to educate the youth on how to have a better future um, and normalizing just learning and, and accepting cultures and the different people um, in society, because we we do make um, we do make the the society that we live in, um, and then being an ally for change. Like this isn't just okay. I'm going to be an ally for black people. This is we. This is just a massive sort of shift in in everything, and we need people. We need people by our side. Um, one thing that I want to say to Andrea. Um, Sajid, everyone basically in this panel, especially you, Mr. Simon, I've got my eye on you, um, is us sort of race com um, commissions, we need to create a forum. We need to create a forum where we're able to collaborate with one another, because like I mentioned very earlier, we take one step forward and we don't know how to deal with the backlash. And we need to have, we need to strategize and we need to have a clear strategy on how we approach um, the issues that we need to approach. Um, and then after, you know, deciding how we sort of approach them, how we then deal with any sort of like negativity that might come after it, because it's so important for us to take care of our, our sanity, as well as making sure that we sort of deliver social change, because it's hard and it's tiring, but we wouldn't be here um, if we didn't have hope. I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't be here if I didn't have hope. So my sort of message is don't let this, don't let this be a fading moment, let this be a long lasting moment um, and one that delivers progressive change. Thanks, thanks Lisa. Well, there's a great challenge there to take forward the conversation and, you know, to strategize. We're not all going to agree, but we can strategize on how to make these changes happen. So do share your thoughts with us, please, if you've taken part on this, uh, um, uh, on the hashtag and elsewhere about how we, how we meet these challenges. I'd just like to give an example of, um, uh, you know, just a specific change I'd like to see um, if this commission, for example, is going to report by Christmas. I think by the end of next year in a society where one out of six people are from various non-white backgrounds, I think we could end all white boardrooms in this country, not just in the FTSE 100 and the FTSE 350, but in the major charities, in the NHS trusts, in the sporting bodies, not as just find somebody you know, put them in the room and carry on, but as a way to have then a conversation about what are the changes that organisation makes about race equality, why should it be one person, you know, it could be more than one person, what's that organisation going to do to check where it is on CV discrimination, if you've got 
an ethnic name year on year to make progress. So um, I'd love to hear other people's views about the changes they'd like to see and prioritise that are specific to the race agenda we need to take forward. Thanks everybody for listening, contributing questions. Thanks especially to my panel, um, current leaders as well as future leaders there. Lisa, you're a current leader. Simon, you'll always be a leader. Uh, Andrea, Sarji, thanks very much for your contributions. Thanks for everybody's questions and I hope we can keep this conversation going. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.